Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am John Laboda, a member of the class of 2002. I'm a mergers and acquisitions lawyer with Carrier Global Corporation. Carrier is one of the world's leading building technologies companies. You may know Carrier as the inventor of modern air conditioning. I'm a member of the University Alumni Board, a group that represents each of the university schools with the purpose of engaging all alumni and students in a lifelong connection with one another and with the university. Today's lecture is part of a new series called Experience Rochester that will exemplify the university's commitment to lifelong learning. We will feature topics and speakers unique to the university. And for now, these experiences will take place virtually. In the future, you will have the opportunity to join us for in-person events. We have a wide range of registrants joining us for this session from friends of the university, parents, current students, to alumni from as far back as 1955, and also incoming students from the class of 2024. We have over 1,100 registrants for today's program. Before today's lecture begins, I'd like to share a few Zoom webinar tips to those new to the platform. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit it through the Q&A function that is located at the bottom of the screen. Professor Kocha Lakota will answer questions at the end of the presentation. If you'd like to view the session with closed caption, Click CC on the bottom toolbar and select Turn On Subtitles. If you're having trouble viewing the webinar, you can call in and listen using the phone number that was included in your confirmation email. Now, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Narayana Kochalakota is the Lionel W. McKinsey Professor of Economics at the University of Rochester. He has published more than 50 articles in a wide range of fields, including monetary and financial economics. Before joining the University of Rochester, he, he was president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis and served as a member of the Federal Reserve's Monetary Policy Committee. He's been an active public commentator on economic policy since his arrival in Rochester. Maggie Sanicandro, today's moderator, became a University of Rochester alumna just this month. She double majored in economics and, public, and political science and minored in French and math and graduated Phi Beta Kappa. Now that she has graduated, she will join the economic consulting firm analysis group as an analyst. Thank you again for joining us. And I will now turn today's presentation over to Professor Kocha Lakota. Thank you so much for joining uh, me today. I'm really looking forward to our, our conversation. I'm gonna open up with some prepared remarks, but um, as John alluded to, uh, we'll have a, a Q and A session at the end of the end of my prepared remarks that will moderate. It'll be a very interesting uh, dialogue, um, probably more interesting than anything I'm going to say. Uh, you're going to hear a, a lot about uncertainty. Um, and you know, I, 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 everything I say, I offer with a lot of humility because certainly the world has changed uh, tremendously compared to uh, where, where we were in um, February 15th. Uh, just over three months ago, and uh, everything I say has to be viewed as having a lot of uncertainty associated with it, just given the nature of the, uh, the, the pandemic that we're living through. So what I'm going to talk about in my prepared remarks, I'm going to start by talking about the current state of the U.S. economy. Um, I'm going to offer three outlooks for the U.S. economy, and if you remember the Goldilocks story, it's going to be a little like that. Um, I'm going to close with two key policy questions. I won't have much in the way of answers. Um, and, I'll, and then I'll, we'll turn to your questions. I will say that uh, the title for this, uh, the webinar ended up being a little misleading relative to what I'm going to say in my prepared remarks. I'm not going to say much about after the pandemic, but um, I'm certainly happy to take questions about that when we, we get there. Let me start by talking about where we are today. Now, economists uh, typically measure uh, what's going on at the, at the macro level, the aggregate level in the economy through what's called real gross domestic product. So what's real gross, gross domestic product? So real gross domestic product is, the first part is the gross domestic product part. And that's the value of everything that's been produced in the United States over a given period of time in dollars. 
Honestly, the government tr goes out and tries to measure everything that's been produced in the United States uh, and assign a dollar value to it using prices, and then you just add that up. Now, so that's what gross domestic product is. That can change from uh, year to year and quarter to quarter for a couple of different reasons. One of which is, uh, I just described how you have to multiply everything that's been produced, um, uh, the number of, number of uh, cars that's been produced, for example, by the prices of those cars. Well, there's two reasons gross domestic product can be changing. One is because prices are changing and the other is because quantities are changing. And what we attempt to do, and the government attempts to do, is through using this term through real gross domestic product is to take out um, the average movement in prices that is taking place across all goods and services. Because that's regarded as simply being due to um, uh, the fact that prices are going up, not that we're actually producing that any, anything more. And so that's the, that's the term that we call real gross domestic product. Now we all often look at this at a quarterly uh, frequency that is from one quarter to the next. So this is a, talking about the first three months of the year. So the first three months, um, remember it's a long time ago now, but you'll remember the first three months, January, February, March. And you know if we get to even through halfway through that quarter or even two thirds of the way through that quarter, it probably looked like just another quarter. Um, then, uh, obviously, in the United States, um, uh, uh, the economy changed very dramatically in March. And we saw some of that uh, in a, the form of a fall in real gross domestic product from the end of um, last year, 2019, to the first quarter of this year. And real gross domestic product fell by about 1% um, from the last quarter of last year to the first quarter of this year. Now, we're expecting to see a much larger fall in gross domestic product from the first to second quarter of this year by about 10%. Uh, let me just say one thing. You might hear bigger numbers in this uh, tossed around in the media. The number is more like somewhere between 30 and 40%. This is because of a peculiar feature of how the United States reports um, gr uh, growth in, in real gross domestic product from one quarter to the next. Uh, typically, the US government annualizes that. Um, so when I, I talked about real gross domestic product falling from one, by 1.2% 1 in from the last quarter of, the, of 2019 to the first quarter of this year, that you'll, you're, you might hear a number like 4.8% because they've, they've annualized it. Just pretend that would happen for four quarters as opposed to just one. So this number is not annualized. This is the actual raw change in gross domestic, real gross domestic product from one quarter to the next. 10% is about, it means lost about four years of growth, more than five years growth in one quarter. It's never happened before in U.S. history. In the Great Recession, many of you remember that, um, the real gross domestic product fell by less than 5% throughout the whole Great Recession. Um, this was in the Great Depression, we go back long ways, 1929 to 32, we saw real, real gross domestic product fall by about 10% per year in the, the first three years of the Great, Great Depression. Um, so this is on a quarterly basis. This is just unheard of in US history. Now, we see this uh, uh, fall in output in the US being mirrored in what's going on in unemployment. So it's the fraction of people who, um, either are, who, are, who are looking for a job but can't find it. And the unemployment rate is, was 14.7% in mid-April. This is the highest. Um, that we've seen the unemployment rate be since, since 1939. Uh, context for that, uh, again, in the Great Recession, the unemployment rate peaked at, at 10%. So this was in October of 2009, right after the Great Recession. Um, in the great, now the Great Depression is known as great, not just because unemployment got very high, it got up to 25% actually in, the, um, in, in 1932, but it's because of how long it lasted from 1929 to 39. And, um, nobody um, that I, I, I've read expects that kind of 10 year long double digit uh, unemployment in, 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 the, in the current current episode. Nonetheless, this is very striking. And it's likely that the unemployment will rise still further in May, be near 20%. I think we'll start to see unemployment begin to fall from May to June, as we see more 
uh, businesses uh, opening up and some, some rehiring taking place. But these numbers are very high. Um, you know, in, in, uh, in the US context is shockingly high to see, see unemployment at this level. Uh, we generally think of, um, there, uh, unemployment is a little bit difficult to know what it should be, you know, in, oh, in what's a normal unemployment rate, but a number that's under 5% or under is generally viewed as being a number that um, policymakers are comfortable with. Um, in February, we were at the, had the lowest unemployment rate that we'd seen in 50 years, um, more than 50 years, and it was, it was at 3.5%. So we've seen an enormous change in the unemployment rate in, in a very short period of time, just as we uh, mirroring what's going on in the world. So the policy response, very rapid and large. Um, we've seen massive federal government programs to, uh, to, to help out those who make under uh, $75,000 per year. So those are individuals who make under $75,000 per year. We've also seen uh, interventions to help out uh, couples or households that make uh, under 150,000, um, two wage earner uh, households make under 150,000 per year uh, to help out the unemployed. And also lending programs to help out both large and small business. Um, I'm not even mentioning everything that's been done um, in terms of the, the Federal Reserve, um, has the Central Bank of the U.S. has also uh, rolled out programs to try to try to uh, help out mini municipalities and state governments with by lending to them. Um, one thing I'll say about all these programs, though, is that the, they were they were rolled out in late March, and the perception I think underlying these programs was that this was going to be a short-lived downturn, and that. Um, by September, at the latest, and even by July, we would start to see a, a very strong recovery. Um, that's not to say that won't happen, and it's not to say that it will happen. It's simply to say that that is the basis for these kind of interventions. And so as we move now into late May, um, there's, uh, there's talk about doing more, uh, for example, to help out state and local governments, maybe doing more to help out the unemployed. Um, that's you know under discussion in Congress. Okay, but the policy response was very rapid in March, um, and uh, and I, I think has been helpful in 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 supporting the economy. So this, you know, all this is by way of very bad news for the economy where we are today, and where we're going to be in the second quarter. Uh, when we look back at the second quarter of 2020, it's going to look like. On a, a quarter, we had very low production in the U.S. and we had very high unemployment. There are a couple of glimmers of news, though, that um, by standards of most recessions, the an unusually large fraction of the unemployed expect their layoffs to be temporary. Now, they might be wrong in that expectation, but they foresaw that they would be able to go back to their old jobs um, and relatively soon. And that's a very that's very good news. Okay, so that's that's um, um, means that the connection between uh, the people who have lost their job and their old job has not been broken, at least in the minds of, uh, of, of the people the people who become unemployed. And that's very good news in terms of thinking that we might be able to see a very fast recovery. The other piece of the um, puzzle or picture that I'm gonna, uh, we've got a lot of questions about this and I'm expecting we'll pick it up again in our question and answer session. But um, policymakers, notably monetary policymakers, the Federal Reserve, expect inflation to stay low. So inflation, the Federal Reserve views 2% as their target level of inflation. They've announced that, that's what they try to hit. But they've been unsuccessful over the last decade or so with, with hitting that on inflation rate. Uh, it's been, uh, inflation has been low relative to that um, target. Over the, over the past 10 years, and it's expected to remain low. Now, why, why is this good news? Well, uh, if you're on a, a fixed an, uh, annual income, nominal income, of course, this is clearly good news because you'll be able to buy more goods and services. But it's good news for a more subtle reason as well, which is it allows policymakers to have more room in terms of providing the kind of stimulus for the economy, for the support for the economy that we've talked about in the, in the, uh, already. 
if uh, the Federal Reserve has done a, a, been a key player in what the federal government has done to help the economy, I think the Federal Reserve would be more concerned about being supportive if they saw inflation running consistently above their target over the past five years, for example. But that's not the situation. Inflationary pressures both here and around the world have been low in the past and they're expected to, to stay low. So that's where we are. Um, we're in a, uh, uh, the growth situation is quite negative. Uh, we've seen, uh, we've lost five years of growth in, in uh, one quarter, three months. Um, we have very high unemployment rates. We have these glimmers of good news. Um, and I think that has allowed um, very uh, aggressive federal government uh, interventions. So let me talk about where we're gonna go. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna have three different outlooks. Um, and they're gonna be um, good, medium, and bad. Um, it's really, it's always difficult to, be a, to do economic forecasting. Um, and you always do, uh, always do it with a lot of humility. Because uh, you, know, you know, the future is very difficult to, 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 to know what's gonna happen, of course. Um, it's especially difficult now. And it's difficult because it's not just about economics. Um, you know, as a macroeconomist, uh, I'm involved in forecasting the economy for much of the past 10 years. And generally you look at what's going on in the economy and that tells you the picture. What's really important right now, I think, as you look ahead, is also to be trying to take into account the epidemiological outlook. What's gonna be happening with COVID-19? And what's gonna be happening for the, in terms of the public health response to COVID-19? Um, this, of course, is a pure epidemi epidemiological question. This is more of a political slash epidemiological question. But that's the politics. Politics always enters into economic forecasting. You, if you're forecasting what's going to happen in the economy, you sort of have to know what Congress is going to be doing in terms of taxes and spending. So that part isn't so new, but this part is very new. It's, uh, I'll be frank, I didn't know anything about epi epidemiology um, in February, and now I would say I've read enough to be dangerous with it. That's about it. But I'm going to try as best I can to ground what I'm going to say about the economy in what I've learned and read from um, what epidemiologists are saying. Um, the public health responses are really critical here. And there's two kinds of public health responses that I, I think are important to keep in mind. So one kind of public health response is social distancing. And these are both gonna be legally mandated social distancing um, of the kind that here in New York State we're, we're very familiar with and uh, really many parts of the country are familiar with it, that um, the, the so-called so lockdowns. Um, of, of seeing a business um, unless you're there. Um, so some of that, so the question is, we're seeing that ease up all around the country now, um, but they're also gonna continue to see self-imposed social distancing as people are nervous and concerned about the disease. Um, you know, and, and Chairman Powell, uh, Jerome Powell, who's the chairman of the Federal Reserve, has really emphasized that he's expecting this to be a continued drag on the recovery is not, even if legal restrictions are removed, um, people are gonna be loath to, to, go, to go to restaurants as much as they used to, et cetera. Now, the second piece I'm gonna emphasize is testing, tracing, and quarantining. Um, there's a lot of emphasis in the public dialogue on testing, but really you need all three components. So what this does is it means that um, if the government is testing, finding out who's testing positive, tracing who those people have seen in the last two weeks, and then quarantining anyone who's tested positive, that really can slow the spread of the disease. And that means that we're gonna be able to function more effectively economically, because we don't have to have as much social distancing to, conserve, to, to reduce the spread of the disease in the, in the population. So the more and a better uh, testing program we have, and I'm gonna use TTQ because I really want you to take away uh, that it's not just testing that's at stake here. It's really testing, tracing, and then quarantining of, of um, people who are, who are testing positive. Um, if the more we do that, the less social distancing we're gonna need in, in order to maintain, um, to make sure to keep the spread of the disease at a, a level that policymakers are, are, are comfortable. 
And so, and testing and tracing quarantine is much less costly for the economy than social distancing. So that's going to be really an, a, 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 a backdrop for everything I'm going to say about the economy. So we talk about the optimistic outlook. And I, I think this outlook really is important one to understand because it, I think it underscores uh, how uh, Congress and, and really the Federal Reserve was thinking about the disease in, in March. And I think some people um, in, in Congress and, and, and the administration are still thinking about um, the, the, the COVID-19 largely in this way, that it will be largely behind us um, by June or coming close to June now. Uh, to be fair to the vice president, he made these statements a little earlier in the month and he might, you know, I'm just quoting him from what he said earlier in May. Um, but at least so far, um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of epidemiological support for this view, but with, with that said, certainly um, the, the situation continues to evolve. And so it could be that this, this view will come to be true. Um, but right now there's, there's a little, uh, as far as I've read, formal epidemiological support for this, for this perspective. Now under this uh, optimistic outlook, uh, real GDP will grow very rapidly in the second half of 2020. Um, I have here by 10%. Um, now, once these numbers get this big, a fall of 10% followed by an increase of 10% means you're still down. Uh, you know, it's just uh, multiplication, but you will still be down by a percentage point. So, and usually we grow by, by uh, two to two and a half percent a year. So this is, this is means that 2020 will still be a negative year um, uh, in terms of growth, uh, even if we do have this very rapid um, recovery. But uh, the unemployment rate will fall into single digits by the year, end of the year and be close to 5% by the end of 2021, which is this uh, um, marker that I, I highlighted earlier as being one that policymakers are typically comfortable with. So that is, and this is very fast growth. Um, I doubt we've ever, we've seen growth of that kind in the, I'm sure we haven't seen it in the post-World War II era. We may have seen it during World War II when the U.S. was ramping up for, uh, for, for, uh, for its military engagement. So that's the optimistic outlook, the good outlook. The modal outlook, this is uh, closer from the economic point of view with, I would say the typical forecaster is, 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 is saying is going to be happening. So here, the virus remains potent, remains important, but we have much better testing and tracing and quarantining in place over the next six months. And that means we can ease up on social distancing. You can open up safely because we have these programs in place. Now, real GDP under this outlook grows by 5% in the second half of the year. We're not really close to making up the 10% pretty fast by historical standards. Um, the unemployment rate remains above 10%, so it remains double digits through the end of this year, and it doesn't get back to 5% until the end of, of 2022. So the, the you know, you, you, not, not next year, but the following year. So the pessimistic outlook. So the pessimistic outlook is that we're not able to implement effective uh, uh, tra uh, tracing and, and uh, testing, tracing, quarantining. Um, there's a number of reasons for this. Um, first of all, I, I think actually we probably have to need some improvement in technology on the testing part to be effective on this. But there's also a lot of concerns about privacy associated with tracing. Um, and it, to be a gr good program, it's not enough to have this done at the county level because people move from county to county. Uh, you want to be able to trace their, their connections. You know, people don't always stay in Monroe County. They move from Monroe to Ontario or even Monroe County to other places in the United States. And you've got to be able to be able to trace across those, uh, their contacts across that movement. So without that, maybe we're not going to be able to do well on this. Without this, I, you're going to end up with a lot of social distancing restrictions. Some of this will be uh, legally mandated, as we have outbreaks recur. Uh, states are, and, and uh, local governments are going to move to shut down their business, their, their economies again. Um, but there, but I, I don't want to. I think it's important not to exaggerate this. The other part of it will be self-imposed. That people will not be willing to to uh, go out and and. Uh, 
buy goods and services that require proximity to others if um, we don't have a sense of safety in the, in the economy. So this would mean essentially no growth in the second half of 2020. And here I think the, you know, it's pretty, uh, it's a bleak outlook, it's a pessimistic outlook. Unemployment remains very elevated, um, probably in the teens. Um, and you'll hear um, uh, the chairman of the Fed, for example, again, I'll highlight him, uh, say, well, you know, uh, we're really waiting for a vaccine to come along. Until a vaccine is implemented, we're going to have people be nervous and afraid of going out to, to, to buy goods and services. And so we're likely to have elevated unemployment. Or until we reach herd immunity, which is basically enough people have had the disease, have antibodies against it, that we don't have to worry about um, it's being spreading very easily across, across individuals. Both of these are, are, you know, this is again getting out of my uh, depth because it's more epidemiologically speaking, but as far as I've read, both of these are um, events that are going to be a, a ways away. So let me close with two policy questions. You always, when you do policy making, you're always thinking, what's the worst that can happen? How can we rule that out? And I think to rule out the pessimistic outlook, we really need an effective national uh, testing and tracing quarantining program. I think it's a very open question whether that will happen or not. Um, and then I think the other question is, suppose a recession, uh, we have elevated unemployment for, for, for many years, will Congress be really willing to step up and provide the kind of support um, that's needed for the economy, the fiscal support that's needed for the economy? Um, I think these are both very, very open questions. Um, and I, so I don't have answers for them, but I think they're very important questions as we go forward and we think about how can we make sure this pessimistic outlook doesn't happen. Um, we, right fiscal monetary policy can help and also even more the right public health policy. Can help. So that's all I had to say. Thank you very much for listening. Um, at this point, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and I'm going to um, turn things over to our moderator for today, uh, for the rest of the uh, program. That's uh, Maggie Senecandro. As John mentioned, Maggie just got her degree in uh, earlier this month. Uh, Maggie was a student of mine, uh, not this year, but last year in uh, my undergraduate course on money, credit, and banking. She was a uh, top student. And, um, and this year she was a, a teaching assistant. So she's uh, very well versed in uh, uh, everything, everything uh, <laughs> that I talked about today. Great. Hi, Professor. Thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone who sent in questions. We got a ton of questions sent in beforehand and a ton of questions are being asked now. So I don't think we will get through them all, but we're going to get through as many as possible. So uh, let's just jump right in. Um, so the first question I have, I want to ask on behalf of current students and recent graduates who are attending today, including myself. Um, what I've been hearing from my classmates and from my friends is a lot of concern about uh, the world we're about to enter. So could you comment a little bit on how my cohort might be affected um, as we enter the la labor market and in the long term? Yeah, I think, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, it's very understandable. Um, certainly, it's, uh, the mar labor market is challenged. Um, the, the general principle, and I haven't looked at the numbers for, for April, though, uh, but I, I suspect this will be true, that Having a college degree, having a degree, especially from a college as good as the University of Rochester, does insulate you against the worst of the, of the, the downturn in the labor markets. Um, there is a, there is, has been research to show that the impact on, the, on new entrants to labor markets uh, from entering in a recession is, uh, is adverse. Uh, my colleague, Lisa Khan, who's a professor here at the University of Rochester, has done some excellent work along these lines that uh, shows that these, these effects end up being, being very durable. Um, here though, I would add on to what Lisa's done is those effects of, of a recessionary effects of when you enter end up really getting dwarfed by what happens over the course of your lifetime. And the most important thing as your, your new graduate is always, and that's especially true as we think about the uncertainty we're in right now, really be flexible, really be willing to take on and open to new challenges is that flexibility, I think, will pay off in terms of good outcomes for you uh, down the road, no matter how um, tough things seem right now. Great, thank you. 
Um, so we received a lot of questions sort of in a similar vein, people asking about uh, different sectors. Um, we got questions about how academia might be affected, how real estate might be affected, um, how medical research might be affected. Um, so sort of to generalize and group these questions together, um, could you talk a little bit about what sectors you think might be um, sort of the winners and losers of this situation? Who's going to come out strongest? Who might be the hardest hit? Wow, um, those are great questions, but it's, it, it is very difficult to know. Um, it does depend on how uh, long this, this episode is with us, for example. Um, you know, in, in, but certainly, you know, we've relied a lot on tech in the last uh, three months. Um, I think that tech, as long as we need social distancing, um, tech is going to be a winner in that, in that regard. Um, but I, 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer your question by not answering it, <laughs> which is to say that it's exactly my uncertainty about this, where you want to be careful about trying to pick winners and losers in, in, in this right now, and you know what sector should be winning, which sector should be losing, which ones should we be supporting? If you're the government, you have a lot of money to hand now. Which sector should we try to support? Um, we, we're going through, we're going through a period where there might be a lot of change. It might be efficient, optimal for the economy to have a lot of change. And so trying to pick winners and losers in that situation, very difficult to do. And, and uh, um, I wouldn't want to be the one doing it. And I'm not sure I want my elected officials either being, being the ones doing it. Great. Um, and so another really popular question that we have got is about the stock market. Um, a lot of people want to know what your thoughts are on the stock market. Uh, specifically, we have a question from Peter Martin. He asks uh, if there's a disconnect between uh, what we're seeing in the stock market and some of the more dire economic predictions we have talked about. I, you know, it's, uh, I'll say a couple of things. First, I am, uh, um, I was surprised by how much market fell, the market fell dramatically between the uh, third week of February and about the uh, third week of March. That one month, it, it fell by a lot, um, I want to say 30%, but, uh, and, but it has recovered uh, uh, remarkably. So both the fall and the strength of the recovery have been surprising to me. Um, and uh, uh, so I, I don't like to forecast the stock market because I'm often surprised by how it does. Um, and where we are today, yeah, I do see you know, I hesitate to say this, but I do see a little bit of a disconnect between where we are in the stock market and and where um, we are in the economy. The stock market, if you just look at the, the indexes, they're the, as strong as they were a year ago, if not actually maybe stronger. Part of this is because I think we've moved into a very low interest rate environment for a very long period of time. So if you think about stocks, um, one of the, the key drivers for that is if bonds get are viewed as paying a very low interest rate, people are going to tumble in to buy risky and that drives up the price of stocks. And so I think that's part of what we're seeing. Um, and so, I, but uh, there's, there continued, but with that said, it does, I am surprised by how high, how high uh, stock, the stock market is. Um, and so we've also gotten quite a few questions. Um, I know this is sort of your area about the Fed and what they've been doing. And I know you mentioned it, briefly in your presentation, but if you'd like to comment a little more basically on what tools they've been using and how effective you think those tools are and if, do you think they should be doing anything differently? Well, the Fed has been doing a lot. And so the, the starting point for what they did is uh, they cut interest rates um, now, but they didn't have a lot of room there. So interest rates were uh, around two and a half percent on the short-term interest rate and they cut that down to close to zero. Um, so that was what I would call standard monetary policy. And the idea behind that is you're making it uh, easier for people to borrow and it's cheaper for them to borrow if they can get access to those low interest rates. And um, it also makes it less attractive to save. And so this is all in a by way of saying, oh, why don't we try to encourage people to go out and spend. Um, and by and that, obviously the economy was shut down to a, to a large extent. Um, uh, it was hard to buy goods and services nonetheless, there were still goods and services to be bought. You could uh, do takeout food from a more expensive restaurant than from a cheaper restaurant. And um, those more expensive restaurants um, might be hire more people or they pay higher wages. So all of this is by way of help, trying to help the economy. 
The Fed also saw, and these are a little more complicated technical things to talk through, but were very important in terms of what the Fed saw. The Fed saw that um, the interest rates that corporations were borrowing at in um, March really rose very, um, by a large amount um, relative to where treasuries were. So treasuries, the, the rate at which the government could borrow was falling as everyone said, wow, the world is a very scary place. Uh, I want some asset that I view as very safe. Let me go out and buy um, US treasuries because it'll sound very safe. So, um, but at the same time, uh, corporate bonds were, the yields were going up. And the Fed for, saw a lot of that as being simply due to um, concerns about the liquidity of those bonds, meaning that people were not willing to buy the, the corporate bonds simply because they were worried about whether they'd be able to find another buy for it when they needed to sell it. Um, the Fed never worries about liquidity because they are the ultimate, we can buy this, hold it forever because we're always going to be around. We don't need to ever sell. And so they, a lot of their interventions are basically along the lines of we stand ready to buy corporate bonds or lend to corporations, buy, the, buy bonds at a higher price and, and lend to corporations at a low interest rate. I think these have been very effective. They really helped to collapse spreads. Actually, the Fed remarkably has not had to actually buy much. It's a, that simply saying we're standing ready to do these things is actually enough. Um, and this is uh, central banker, central banks, because they have so much ability to in, intervene, they actually don't even need to use it. They can just talk about being willing to do it. Um, so this is uh, what the Fed has done. Um, there, now, as we go forward, I think there's going to be uh, some conversations about uh, the Fed has leaned on Congress to do more. Um, and Powell, the chairman of the Fed, has emphasized the Fed is not in the business of being able to hand out money directly. They can make loans at low interest rates. Um, but even that, they like to be insulated from all, they're very fond of boasting that they've never lost money on any loan. And so they're going to be very careful about their lending. So I think that they're, they've been calling on Congress to, to, take the, to take the next step in terms of trying to support the economy. I, I think we'll see more from the Fed, probably um, trying to lower longer term interest rates. I've talked about them lowering short term interest rates, probably lowering, trying to lower longer term interest rates from where they are. It's not a lot of room there, honestly. Uh, longer term interest rates, even if you get up to 30 years are really about a percentage point or so. So there's some room to be there done there. Uh, but honestly, um, I think uh, the Fed has done what it can at this point. There's maybe a little more room for them, but they're left with uh, saying, look, we've done what we can. Congress, it's, it's your turn to step up. Great, thank you. Um, and so I guess we have a set of questions that relates to what the Fed has been doing and what Congress has been doing and how uh, these programs might uh, affect the economy. So um, as you noted before, we did get a ton of questions on inflation. Um, so you said in your presentation that we're expecting it to stay uh, pretty low, but if you could just go more into sort of what factors are driving that prediction. We've had some people, uh, Jody asked if lower demand could lead to a deflation. Um, we've got Timothy asking about how the fiscal stimulus is going to uh, affect inflation. So just sort of what, what factors are you thinking about there? So um, as Maggie well knows, We've actually, uh, shock is a little bit difficult to parse out. Um, unlike in uh, 2008 and 2009, the Great Recession shock, it was basically people lost a lot of wealth in their houses. And they couldn't spend as much as a result. So it was pretty much a, a straight, um, what we call demand shock. And a demand shocks mean that people can't spend as much. And that means that um, uh, companies can't charge as high prices and they can't hire as many workers. So prices tend to fall, they're downward pressure, disinflationary pressures uh, in the, in, uh, as a result. Here, we're seeing two kinds of uh, shocks go on. One is that there's demand shocks that people are not willing to go out and uh, travel on airplanes as much as they might want to. They're not as eager to go on cruises. Um, you know, we can talk about I mean, highlighting maybe the most obvious, but there's lots of, of goods and services that require social proximity that people are not gonna be as willing to engage in, in buying. So that's a, a straight demand shock. At the same time, uh, the uncertainty we're living in mean that businesses are very worried about investing. So a huge part of what 
makes the economy move at fluctuations in physical investment. And that is, uh, means, you know, do you want to start a factory now? Well, yes, if you're a business, you really don't know what the world's going to look like in a year or two or three years. So you're going to be very reluctant to, to, to engage in, in building uh, in, in investment. All this is in downward on demand. At the same time, we have negative uh, supply sh side shock going on where we, we have governments basically saying, well, you know, uh, we don't want um, you to be producing as much as you used to because that's actually going to lead to the, the spread of the disease. And so you have both, both uh, components going on. I think the judgment of most people at this stage is that the demand side is going to win. Um, that I think there has to be some humility offered about that. I think a large reason for that is, boy, this is, we've seen very strong disinflationary forces around the world for a very long time. Um, and so that we've seen downward pressure on inflation around the world. So we'd have to reverse that pretty dramatically. Um, we don't see what we, we can look at is what um, we can look at surveys, what people think inflation is going to look like in the future. We can also look at what market participants are betting inflation is going to look like. Uh, and that those both look uh, very low. And that there's a more US specific phenomenon, which is that I mentioned how people in times of uncertainty really rushed to buy US uh, dollar, uh, dollar denominated uh, assets like treasuries. Well, that means that that tends to drive up the dollar relative to other currencies. That makes goods and services we buy from overseas um, cheaper. And that also is a downward uh, pressure on inflation. So with all that said, I, I, that, these are the elements of why I'm forecasting low inflation. It is true though, that we have the supply component. And if we, you're gonna, that supply component is showing up in some goods and services. So certainly in food prices, um, you're gonna see upward pressure on meat prices, for example, definitely seen that already. But overall, um, I think we're gonna, the net is we're gonna, we're gonna see um, uh, downward pressures on inflation. Now, if we were to see upward pressure on inflation, it's not, you know, it's not a big deal. Um, I mean, let me have to be careful what I say. But, but the Fed has the tools to control inflation. It's disinflation is much more difficult because I mentioned the Fed doesn't have a lot of tools left. So they can't ease a lot more, but they can tighten. I mean, they can easily tighten by raising interest rates. What we, we'd be worried about is if unemployment were very high and they had to do that, that would be very tough on the economy. But they have the ability to control inflation given the, the tools at their disposal. Great. Um, and so I guess the other major concern besides inflation that people have been asking about uh, with concern to these programs is about uh, the effect on the federal debt. Um, so Alan asks how the uh, sudden addition of debt to the U.S. might affect the economy, both the U.S. and the global economy, and maybe if there's unintended consequences involved there. Yeah, I, I, these are, this is a great question. Um, there's a lot of discussion and debate among um, among economists about this. Um, and I think if you go back to 10 years ago during the Great Recession, this was a, a big concern among, among uh, many policymakers that um, the debt, debt was high in the US and the United Kingdom. Uh, and, and adding to it, what's What's that going to mean? I mean, I mean we're going to, uh, people are going to worry about the U.S. government defaulting or, or something like that. Interest rates would spike. There are a lot of concerns expressed on that like that. Well, a little bit of this is just habit. We've gotten used to living with a lot of debt. And, um, but there's also data to back this up. We've seen huge expansions in the, in the debt in, in Japan, in the United States, even over the past 10 years. And uh, interest rates have not been going up. There's not a sign that people are worried about default of any kind. They're not worried about um, uh, a sudden slide in the value of these pieces of paper. Um, quite the contrary. As soon as we have a recession of the kind we're in, you see people running for the safety of treasuries um, and to a lesser extent, some, some other uh, country sovereign debt. So at least right now, um, you know, I, I think it's very, one thing I would say, very important to watch prices as opposed to quantities. Prices are what matters. Quantities are only an input into thinking about prices. So as long as interest rates remain low um, and, 
and, and, and there are ways to see how market participants are betting on interest rates. As long as you continue to bet on interest rates remaining low, I, I don't see much, much in the way of risk from, from the increases in the debt. Um, so we've talked a lot about the U.S., but we have a very international audience here. So I want to have a couple questions about the global economy. Um, so I have one from Elizabeth. She asks, um, how do you think about this crisis and its impact uh, relative to developed markets versus emerging markets? Um, and if you could comment specifically on China. So China is a... Um, is a big country, obviously, um, in terms of its economy. Um, and I, 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 we're all getting used to that, I would say, too, because of, because of its very rapid growth. Uh, if you go back 15 years, um, or more, longer than that now, uh, China had a, a scare from the SARS epidemic. Um, we're now going through the second, essentially, SARS-CoV-2. That was SARS-CoV-1. And um, but that downturn in the Chinese economy was not viewed as having much in the way of global consequences because China was not as big as it is as it is now. Now, anything that's happening in China is a, is a, is a big deal. And of course, the other thing is that the, this virus hit China first. And so we can see some of the things that I've said about the U.S. economy, I'm, I'm saying because I see in the, in the Chinese uh, economy. The chi the China has been, I think, much more effective about suppressing the disease than, than we have so far. And, but nonetheless, people are very nervous still about going out and buying goods and services that require social proximity. So I, I think China is, is, um, is a, a country, you know, we're gonna to continue to watch um, in terms of both as an, from the economic point of view, but also from the public health point of view. Um, what can we learn from, from that? Um, boy, you just, this is a disease that's likely to have very adverse consequences for, for emerging markets. Um, you're going to see a lot of death and you're going to see a lot of uh, very uh, negative uh, economic consequences as well. Um, you know, that we're fortunate in the more developed countries to have you know, much better medical care, much better access to medical care. It's not, of course, it's not uh, equally shared among all citizens in our country, but but by and large, we're, you know, we're blessed with that. And so that, that's just going to mean that the disease is much more, more tragic, I think, in terms of consequences in, 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 in emerging markets. Um, you know, in, from the, to take a you know, parochial view, um, emerging markets um, don't impact the U.S. economy that much. China is a big, you know, it's a big, obviously, I, I want to separate China from that, that comment because China is, is big enough to be, be an influence on us. And uh, um, one of the, the final thing I'll add is that as we, we, I've talked about the patchwork of testing and tracing and quarantine programs we see around the US, well, that's even more true around the world. And to, unless we start to see some uniformity in that, we're gonna continue to see um, bar barriers to, to interaction across, across the global economy. And that's gonna be tough for the whole world including the US. Uh, great, so staying on this, this global economy topic a little bit, we have a question from Isaiah about how uh, this COVID crisis might impact international trade um, and whether or not it will increase or decrease uh, global interconnectivity. So do you have any comments on that? You know, this, this, the immediate uh, consequence of it, is it has reduced trade and uh, part, of, part of that is simply, you know, you know, the economies are <laughs> suppressed and so there's not as much trade going on as a result of that. But um, part of it is just uh, interconnectedness is diminished because of uh, the barriers thrown up by the disease. Uh, countries want to, they, they, they can't just operate on the trust that other countries have got the disease under control. Because clearly that's not, not uniformly true across all countries. So you, you end up with, with barriers to interaction and barriers to trade. Where will we be longer term? And, and, you know, any, any forecast that we talk about longer term has got to be offered with a huge amount of uncertainty and humility associated with it. But I, I worry about that. I think that um, um, we're like, we might well see, uh, in Vatican in our times, people, uh, there's a tendency for policymakers to turn inwards, first of all. Um, and in, in these disease-ridden times, the, the, the issue of can we trust everyone else to have the right control over the disease 
that's also going to be a factor in terms of how much interconnectedness we can see going forward. So both of these, so I guess I'm a, I'm a little pessimistic about that, but certainly much a lot of uncertainties. Great. And uh, so uh, last question, I guess, on the, the global economy, we have a question from John asking, um, what have we learned from the reactions of other countries? Are any countries uh, doing a particularly good job? Or are there lessons we can take away from how other countries have been responding? But, you know, this is probably idiosyncratic across economists. Um, you know, I, I'm, uh, I, I think on the economics front, um, you know, I'm biased because I'm a former Federal Reserve employee, but I, I'm pretty impressed with what the Fed has done. Um, I, I think that as we move forward, the Fed is, you know, clearly view this as a relatively short term in terms of their in, in, interventions. They had certain market dysfunctions, as I mentioned, they wanted it to, 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 to correct and they were successful in that. Um, you know, then there's, there's Congress's role and Congress has seen this as uh, something that's going to be gone by September. And, you know, maybe if they're right, they're right. But if they're not, what are they going to do? And we'll have to wait and see on that. But so far, uh, I think on the economics front, I'm pretty, uh, you know, I, I would, I would do, I would have done some things differently, but by and large, I think, you know, if I compare this to other countries, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable where we are. On the public health front, um, I think that, you know, you know, our, our, our federalist approach to politics is not necessarily serving us that well, I think, here. Um, the idea of letting uh, every state pick and choose um, their level of comfort with uh, uh, disease spread, their level, of, and maybe even at the county level, I think it's going to end up really being disruptive to um, having the kind of free flow of goods and services and people that we're going to want to have in the United States. Um, I'll just highlight one example, the state of Vermont, and this might be changing, but right now, um, if you're a New Yorker and you want to go vacation in Vermont, you have to quarantine yourself for two weeks first. And that's not just New Yorkers, it's anybody from out of, out of Vermont. Um, well, that's pretty disruptive. <laughs> and that's because, you know, Vermont has its way of dealing with the disease and, then, and doesn't necessarily trust every other state to be having the same approach. So I think our patchwork approach is not one that's, that's serving as well. And I think countries that are able to adopt something that's more national uh, um, have been more, more effective and more successful. Uh, great, okay. We've had a couple questions about um, economic inequality and how that uh, is playing out here. Either um, we've had some questioners point out that many low earning sectors are the ones that are seeing the most layoffs or as many white collar jobs can telecommute. Um, so what does this, this tell us about economic inequality? And uh, we have a question from Christina asking whether or not this is gonna make the situation worse or better when it comes to inequality. Well, I, I think that it's absolutely true that uh, you look at both the disease and the economic consequences of the disease, they've fallen uh, disproportionately on, on those who are, are in the lower, lower part of the income distribution. Um, I think that what we can try to do is to, to, we've had a shock. It's disproportionately affecting some groups relative to others. The economic economist reaction to that immediately is insurance. To take from those who are less affected and give to those who are more affected. And that's through the tax system. Um, so that, that's something that I, I think that, that Congress should be looking at and I would, you know, I'd be in favor of. They've done a little of that so far, but certainly I would be in favor of doing even more. Um, this has so far been a, a, a economic situation where we track recovery in 2000, coming out of the Great Recession. We're all set up again for that, unfortunately, now because of how strong the stock market is. Those who own stocks, um, you know, the more stocks you own, the better off you are right now. Housing, I, at least so far, has been pretty resilient. So if you own houses, it's been pretty resilient as well. But if you don't own assets, and you're relying on your labor income as your main source of, of income for yourself. You've definitely been hammered here. And I, again, I'm, I think the way to deal with that is view the tax system as a way to ensure people against uh, bad consequences. Great, and I think we just have time for uh, one or two more questions. Um, so I wanna ask one that's a little more long-term. We've had uh, a couple questions involving this. Um, Ray is asking us about, so maybe did this reveal any structural problems in the economy that maybe coming out of this, even once the health concerns are somewhat mitigated, we might see longer term changes there? Wow, I, you know, I, I, I thought that the, 
the big, there are a couple of challenges I, I guess I would point to. A, a lot of economists have pointed to the need for automatic stabilizers. So, so what that means is that instead of having Congress sit around and, and try to debate and figure out what to do, we actually plan for the fact there could be a recession. Um, the, um, the, the, that, that after we, the, in a recession, we immediately kick to a, um, uh, to fiscal interventions. So it's triggered by unemployment going up. I think that's something that we should really be contemplating uh, uh, going forward. Um, so I guess that um, I've gotten the call here to, uh, to wrap up. So, uh, um, so maybe, uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just close with a couple, uh, what, what, a couple of thoughts or one thought really. Everything here about the economy is about public health. And you cannot separate the two. I've tried to tie them together in my talk today. The better we do on the public health dimension, the better we're going to do on the economic dimension. And I think I hear some policymakers talk as if we can just forget about the public health side and just let the economy rip. That's just not going to happen that way. We're only going to have a good economy, a strong economy, if we do um, a better job than we have so far on the public health dimension. I'll, I'll toss things back to you, Maggie. Thanks a lot for all the questions. Great, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to everyone who came and asked such good questions. I'm gonna throw it back to John to wrap us up. Uh, thank you all. Excellent. Thank you, Professor Coach Lakota and Maggie for the wonderful session. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the program and we would like to hear your feedback. Please take a moment to share your thoughts about this session through a brief anonymous survey. The link for the survey will appear on your screen at the end of the webinar. Select continue to get to the survey. Please also plan to join us next week on Thursday, June 4th at noon Eastern for our next Experience Rochester lecture entitled Rochester Responds Coronavirus Research at URMC, featuring a leading research panel from the University of Rochester Medical Center for uncovering ways to diagnose, treat, and even prevent COVID-19. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Stay well.